What's the word, y'all? First of all, I want to apologize for, for the low energy and the change in my voice. It seems like I am sick. All of my tests are coming back negative, so I'm guessing it's a cold. We were cooped in for the last two years, so I completely forgot the common cold exists, and I, I don't even know how, what, what to do with myself. But one thing I won't do is take a day off, because there are people out there that have this crazy conspiracy theory that uh, Kenny don't like the Memphis Grizzlies or the Warriors series, or Kenny don't like the Boston versus Milwaukee series because he finds a way to never upload when those games are on. Here I am through cold, through sickness. I am here to talk about these series. So eliminate all those conspiracies, man. Let's talk about it. Today's video is brought to you by Prize Picks. Hit that link in the description and download the Prize Picks app and use code Kenny because you're matching all deposits up to $100 for new players. See, Sunday we got this uh this game seven, right? Between the Phoenix Suns and the Dallas Mavericks. On the Dallas Mavericks, there's just one guy. I think his name is Luka Doncic. He's averaging like 32 points per game in this series alone, where if he scores just one point and you pick his over, you're in the green, baby. <laughs> Just that simple. That's a layup. Heck, that's a free throw, and you can be in the green. It is a crazy promotion that uh, Prize Picks is running, and you do not want to miss out. And if you're new to Prize Picks, it's just you versus the numbers. You pick some of your favorite or least favorite NBA players. You pick over and under on different things like points, rebounds, assists, and a lot of other things. And if you get them right, you're in the green. I mean, I'm giving you my word that Luka's going to at least score one point on Sunday <laughs> I mean you you got to you got to play there's also another sweepstakes that we're calling the Kenny Beachman sweepstakes that if you use code Kenny you're automatically entered and you can be flown out to Chicago to watch a Bulls game live in the United Center with me next season you just got to use code Kenny you're automatically automatically enter so i want to say thanks again to prize picks for sponsoring this video let's get back to recapping these games the golden state warriors game is the one i'm going to talk about first is the one that's readily on my mind the final score says 14 point win for the warriors but i promise it's a lot closer than that shout out to the memphis grizzlies a hell of a season we're going to talk about that in a second but the golden state warriors close it out game six clay is a real thing people will question if game six clay basically was dead after all of the injuries and the answer is no even though there were times in this game i'm like bro clay your trigger, you're just a little bit too trigger happy. He'll miss two in a row. They hit three after that. You're like, all right, I guess we'll live with that. Bro attempted 22 shots, ended with 30 points. I think that Ty Dillon Brooks with, yeah, with the most points in the entire game. He was incredible today. He was electric. He even's looking at the crowd and he's putting up six fingers because he even he knows that Game 6 Clay is a real thing. And I got to imagine that when you have a nickname like that Game 6 Clay, it's an immense amount of pressure once you hit Game 6 because everybody's now expecting you to turn up and have the best version of yourself he came through for them um, because they needed you don't want to go seven games with a, a Grizzlies team that don't have John Morant again I'm gonna talk about them because this is one hell of a season nothing but a success story and I cannot wait to see what happens next with the Memphis Grizzlies team but game six clay was a real thing Steph Curry struggled for majority of this game but in the fourth quarter he hit some huge huge shots but my MVPs it's, it's co-MVPs number one is Kevon Looney he turned into Dennis Rodman he turned into Wilt Chamberlain who turned into one of the greatest rebounders of all time and in the last two games after Gary Payton the second went down they were deciding to try to match the youth of the Memphis Grizzlies try to match the energy the pace of the Memphis Grizzlies by having Jonathan Kaminga start and every single one of them games they came out so very dry then they went with the good old classic the one we know works which is Kevon Looney at the five he ended with 11 offensive rebounds and in this game bro it was so very ugly very early on for the Golden State Warriors they were throwing the ball all over the place they ended with just 17 turnovers but I promise if you were watching it felt like 30 they on fast breaks a leak out for Klay Thompson and Steph Curry overthrew him the later in the game it was Steph Curry on the leak out and Klay Thompson overthrew him Draymond Green is dribbling off his own foot it's just turnover after turnover after turnover but the thing that balanced it all out was the offensive rebounds Kevon Looney with 11 and my second MVP is is of course stoic wigs there has to be some type of nickname for andrew wiggins that that showcases that bro never shows emotion again the only time i really see him show emotion is when he's dunking on car anthony towns other than that the bro hit a couple huge shots in the fourth quarter got some big blocks got some big offensive rebounds he ain't smile he ain't flex he ain't yell at the crowd he ain't do some no showboating whatsoever for wigs he just got back on defense every single time and it's it's entertaining because draymond green in the third quarter, made a layup over Jared Jackson Jr., and he flexed and yelled at him. And then Wiggins just do something very similar. Let's get back on defense. <laughs> it's like there's so many different personalities here. It's just He just get back on defense. This is what Wiggins do. Um, but he hit some big, big-time shots in this one, especially down in the fourth quarter. Kevon Looney with his great rebounding. And you ask Steph, uh, uh, Clay Thompson getting the game six version of himself, and then Steph
Steph Curry hitting some big old daggers down the stretch. That was all you really needed. I'm excited to see um, who they go against because the Dallas versus Sun series is coming up or coming to an end Sunday. And one thing I question, and you know, we're going to do a whole type of um, preview of whatever series we end up getting. In my notes, it says, I wonder how they play against a team that has better offensive weapons, weapons and better rebounding because the 17 off or the 17 turnovers against a team that's like fully healthy and at their superstars and our good rebound rebounding team that 17 turnovers really is gonna hurt you like nine times out of ten when we talk about a normal game and if you're going against the the phoenix suns if I'm not mistaken, I would uh, uh, guess that they're a better rebounded team than Memphis Grizzlies. They probably not giving up 25 offensive rebounds, but they might turn you over close to the rate of the Memphis Grizzlies. I guess the Memphis Grizzlies is one of the best turnover rate teams in all of basketball. But still, I wonder if they're going against the Suns, will they be able to replicate some of this with the 25 rebounds? Or if they're going against the Dallas Mavericks, maybe... Maybe that's the fable matchup for them because the Dallas Mavericks also try to go small, and then maybe Kevon Looney can take advantage. I don't really know. We're going to do a whole whole preview once we figure out who's winning between Dallas and Phoenix, okay? Let's talk about the Memphis Grizzlies because this is one hell of a series or hell of a season for them. Um, being a play-in team last year, basically defeating the Golden State Warriors to get that last play-in spot or get that last playoff spot, and then for everybody to elevate. And, and we were talking about it on the podcast a little while ago, basically – um, asking each other, what do we do if we were the Memphis Grizzlies this offseason? If you did not know, they got the executive of the year over there. I forget his name already, but he won executive of the year for basically, I guess, drafting very well because it's not like they did a lot of trades. They traded for Steven Adams, but that's pretty much it. This season, it was like draft. I, he didn't even actually do much this year. He traded Grayson Allen. He traded away Jonas Valanciunas and got in Steven Adams, and then everything else is just like growth and development. But maybe it's like giving him the award now for his drafting over the past three years. I don't really, I don't really know. But they, we were asking each other, what do we do if we're the Memphis Grizzlies? Because they had an amazing season, ended up being the 2C, surprising everybody. But there are going to be more teams out there that are going to be completely healthy. The Clippers are going to be back. Um, the Denver Nuggets are going to be back. And how do we prevent ourselves from having a hell of a season this year and being disappointed next year? And what I said in there was, I don't do anything dramatic. I don't try to trade for a secondary superstar to put alongside John Morant. Because in my personal opinion, I looked at all the progression that we got throughout the roster this year. And I'm expecting a lot of those players to get even better. Now, I know progression is not linear, but I look at what John Moran turned in from year two, being a borderline, a player that was in all-star conversations, to being a player for a good chunk of the season was in MVP conversations. He win most improved player. He ends up being an all-NBA player, I would guess, this season. That's a crazy progression from year two to year three. We wonder what he looks like from year three to year four. Desmond Bain went from a good rookie to, like, we believe in him so much, we're going to trade away some pieces that might take some minutes away from him. We're going to give him the key, not the keys, but we're going to have him run a lot of guard this year. We're going to up his usage rate, and boom, in my opinion, he won my most improved player. We see the progression from year one to year two from Desmond Bain. What does year two to year three look like? And then Jaron Jackson Jr. gets better. Maybe Zaire Williams takes a big jump from year one to year two because because it seems like they continue to get better and better and better from, from person one to person 12 every single season. It might even be Brandon Clark who had like a setback Back year last year to come back this year next year he's even better or maybe it's the Anthony Melton who people forget is only like 24 years old I don't know I just believe in the internal development that has been happening within the Memphis Grizzlies and I personally will not do anything to to change that now they do have some decisions with I think Kyle Anderson is, is a free agent this offseason and Tyus Jones even though he did not have a good game today he's going to be a guy that's going to be highly touted in free agency as a good point guard so I don't know how they navigate those things but I'm excited to see what year I was going to say year three for them why, why did I why would I want to say that what the next year for the Memphis Grizzlies looks like this is one hell of a year to be the two seed and take the Golden State Warriors two six consider two six considering that John Moran got in injured early on um just a super super bright future for them but now let's talk about Jason Tatum on Friday the 13th Jason came out to play man it, it right it writes itself bro he came out to play and had like his best playoff performance of all time and that's saying something because I feel like I have even though Jason Tatum's like 23 24 years old I feel like I have a ton of playoff moments in my mind from Jason Tatum whether it's dunking on LeBron when he was a rookie or even earlier this season the game when a layup against the against the uh Brooklyn Nets and then today putting his stamp of approval or a stamp on this game I mean early in it I wouldn't say he was struggling 
But yeah, at the end of the first half, he, ended, he had 18 points, which is great. He had a lot of shots, but he, he was shooting seven for 16. And I think a lot of that is like early in the game, he was trying to get to the basket. And instead of looking to finish the, the like score, he was looking for the fouls and he wasn't getting the whistle. And I think in that second half, he had the same mindset to get to the basket, but instead he was trying to finish. In the second half, man shot 10 for 16. He had three threes and they came like at crucial times. He went on a personal 11-0 run in this one. He was, he was incredible. And you had, let me go to my, oh my, I had a lot of notes for this, if I'm not mistaken. Some of them might be one sentence notes, but hey, uh, let, let me read some of my notes. Tatum is good. Tatum is really good. Tatum's unstoppable. Tatum in the wing three-pointer is a go-to move. L L hey, bro, I be, I be watching these games and just jotting down whatever comes to mind that I want to mention in the video. And is is that his signature move, the sidestep, the sidestep wing three? Is that Jason Tatum's signature move? I love to see that Marcus Smart had a bounce back game. Um, when you think about how game six or uh, game five ended with him having three back to back to back possessions that a lot of people credit to them losing that game, even though, you know, they were blowing like a 13 point league in the fourth quarter. Anyway, it wasn't all Marcus Smart. But anyway, you look at that the way that ended and him coming out today. Early in this one, it felt like Marcus Smart versus Giannis was gonna be the storyline in this one. You know, he ended up with 21 points, he didn't overshoot, he didn't have any turnovers. He played good defense. He had seven assists. This was as big of a bounce back game for Marcus Smart as you can imagine. And it was perfect. Derek White, second quarter, Derek White was great. Um, and I, I won't even say that he finally came to play because I think for the most of this series, he's been okay. He's just not going to be a guy that's going to go out there and shoot if extremely efficient. Even today, he was only one for five. But in the second quarter, he had big time plays and big time moments for them. Uh, Jalen Brown also came to play. And they they take this game or the series to seven. And they were talking about on the broadcast that in the last game of the season, if you remember, the Milwaukee Bucks sat everybody while the Boston Celtics played to win. The Milwaukee Bucks, you know, they said that they weren't trying to avoid the Brooklyn Nets. But let's be honest, people did not really want to play the Brooklyn Nets. And that might come back to bite them. Now, home court advantage hasn't been that big of a thing so far in this series. People have been winning on the road the entire time. But in the Game 7, in the TD Garden, I wonder, will they end up regretting the fact that they set their players because we're getting that game seven in Boston, you know? And, and listen, a lot of credit to the Boston Celtics. They deserve this one. But bro, the Milwaukee Bucks, oh man, oh man, oh man. Giannis gives you a 44-point game, 20 rebounds, six assists. He shot 14 from 15 from the free throw line and you lose because the only other person that came to play offensively was Pat Connaughton. Drew Holiday had the great performance last game and then followed that up with not that good of a performance. Grayson Allen was getting absolutely hunt hunted, and I don't even know how he ended up playing 22 minutes because if I'm Coach Bud and he not hitting the shots and they're hunting him on defense, I don't know why he plays that many minutes. Also, why the hell is George, is George Hill getting as many minutes as he's getting? In the post-game interview, um, Coach Bud, and I, I promise you this is a real quote, or or, or I'm, par I'm a paraphrase because it was a long quote. He was basically saying that we got George out there because we like the way he defends. And I'm, I'm watching this game, and every time George is out there on defense, they're trying to get the switch on George. They're going at George every single time, it felt like. So Bud saying we like his defense, and then somebody else questioned, like, why is his defense different than Javon, who's a way better on-ball defender who fights over these screens? And he was like, he gives them something differently defensively than Javon does. I guess he's alluded to the fact that Javon is more a better one-on-one -on -one defender, where George Hill might be a better team defender. I don't really know. But in the last video, when we were talking about them winning game five, I was I was giving praise to Coach Bud for not playing George Hill more. I think it was like 12 minutes, and today it ended up being 18. And like, Kenny, that's not that big of a difference. But in a game like this, is it is. It is that big of a difference. If if George Hill plays more than 10 minutes next game, oh, in the game seven, oh, Coach Bud. Coach Bud, man. I, hey, listen, that championship saves you, bro. Well, come on, man. Come on. Now, there are rumors that um, there's a chance that Chris Middleton comes back for game seven. I wouldn't necessarily believe those rumors until I see a tweet from Woj or Shams. I would not be trying to uh, bet on this game or anything like that with that in mind, or even like make a prediction to this game because I don't know if he's going to play. And if he does play, I don't know what version of him we're going to get. He's missed the last X amount of games. I don't know. Was it the last 10 playoff games? 
something like that. Oh, early in this game, um, well, not early in this game, but for the entirety of the Bucks' existence under Bud, they play drop coverage, um, and they say, shoot your threes, and we're going to pack the paint. We're going to prevent you from getting to the basket, and if you're going to win this series, you better hit your threes. And in this game, 17 made threes for the Boston Celtics, seven from Tatum, five from Smart, four from um, Jalen Brown. They pretty much had all of them, and Derek White gave them one as well. Um, but in this game, early on, they were doing their typical normal drop coverage, and it was getting smoked. And then there were some possessions where they were, like, switching it. And I was like, oh, my God, Colts Bud is going to switch this up. And then two possessions later, they went back to drop and got killed at drop. So I would expect Coach Bud to maybe do a little bit more switching because it worked out at least a little bit in the small sample size we got in the first, first half of this game. Um, but at least throw them different looks because it seems like that drop coverage is getting dominated from the three. I, I don't know if the Boston Celtics shoot another seven, make another 17 threes or you miss all of your threes. But it's a possibility. It's not the first time that's happened in this series. All right, man, that's really all I have to say. I can't wait for Sunday. We get two game sevens. I'm excited about that. My apologies if my energy wasn't at, at, as high as you normally get it. But, brother, I am sick. I'm just going to hope that this pass is over by Sunday, Sunday night when I got to do my my big recaps for game sevens. Um, I appreciate you watching. Uh, bye.